All right. Welcome, everyone. It's uh, Thursday at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, and, and this is the latest episode of Higher Ed Live. Higher Ed Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network, a series of professional development web shows and podcasts, which are always free and accessible to you in the archives at higheredlive.com and also on iTunes. Be a part of our broadcast by tuning in live and sharing your insights and questions using the, the hashtag HigherEdLive on Twitter. You can also receive uh, weekly updates with the live show dates and times by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. Today's show uh, would not be possible without the support of M. Stoner and Omni Update. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing communications firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. Omni Update is the leading web content management system, CMS, provider for education. The company's web CMS, OU Campus, is secure and scalable with great tools and features, deployment flexibility, and an awesome user community. Part three of Omni Update's small web team series is up on their blog. We just sent out that link on Twitter. Be sure to check it out. All right, so welcome again, everyone. Uh, I've gotten through that without screwing that up. Uh, I am your guest host today, Drew Milliken. I am the Director of Admissions and Financial Aid for Vermont Academy, a uh, 9-12 boarding school located in southern Vermont. Uh, you can get me on Twitter at, at Drew Milliken. That's D-R-E-W-M-I-L-L-I-K-I-N. On today's show, uh, I've got some wonderful guests today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the new education marketplace and expanding the funnel. Uh, we would, love, of course, love to hear your thoughts. Uh, you can send us those uh, anytime by using, again, uh, the Twitter hashtag of Higher Ed Live. So, on to my guests. Uh, with us today, we have uh, Brendan Schneider, uh, who is the Director of Admissions and uh, Admission and Financial Aid at Sewickley Academy, a pre K through 12 day school located near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He is also the founder of SchneiderB.com, a blog where he discusses internet marketing for schools. He also recently launched the Internet Marketing for Schools podcast. Uh, with us as well, we have Jay Goulart. Jay is the co-founder and chief data, data analyst for NewSci LLC, a, for, a firm which provides big data capabilities solely for nonprofit excuse me, solely for the nonprofit sector, and also provides strategic fundraising consulting services. NewSci is the strategic is a strategic partner with IBM. Jay has nearly 20 years' experience uh, leading independent school fundraising shops both within and outside the U.S., and he also has the good fortune of leading a team that was permitted to ignore traditional fundraising wisdom and, as a result, created a strategy <coughs> and systems that attain the highest increase in donor retention within the education sector. Thanks for joining us, Jay. Thanks for having me, Drew. should also thank Brendan for joining us. Uh, and finally, with us today, we have Andy Hurt. Uh, and Andy is the Director of Member Relations uh, for the Association of Boarding School, also known as TABS, uh, based in Nashville, North Carolina. TABS serves college preparatory boarding schools in the United States, Canada, and around the globe. The association leads a domestic and, leads a domestic and international effort to promote awareness and understanding of boarding schools and to expand the applicant pool for member institutions. Uh, TABS is the comprehensive, indispensable resource for educators seeking training, research, guidance, and support on all issues pertaining to the residential school experience. Andy's background is in admissions, having served as the director of admissions at Asheville School uh, and Brooks School, as well as stints at Wittenberg University and King and Buckingham Brown and Nichols. Altogether, Andy's admissions career has spanned over 15 years. So, what a, a jam-packed and uh, very talented uh, group of guests that I have here tonight. Uh, when the group at Higher Ed Live said, hey, Drew, would you mind hosting the show? We'd like you to talk about uh, the general sort of education independent school market. Uh, can you think of anybody who would be interested in being a guest on this show? I immediately thought of these three gentlemen, and despite their better judgment, they all agreed to say, yeah, absolutely. We'd love to do it, and uh, I'm thrilled to have them all here today. So thank you, gentlemen, again. Yeah. Thank you for having us, Drew. Absolutely. So, you know, I think it makes sense just to kind of start this conversation off, and this is definitely meant to be a conversation, 
but kind of going over like what the actual market looks like right now. What's the sort of marketplace that we're in? And uh, maybe Andy, maybe you want to touch a little bit on that. Sure, sure. And again, thanks for for having for having me and having all of us uh, excited to to take part in this conversation. And this is sort of a a conversation that uh, that we at Tabs are involved in uh, constantly. Um, and it is the issue that um, is um, it's the it's the biggest issue facing our schools, uh, boarding schools. We have almost 300 member schools in our association, and it's without question the biggest issue that's facing our schools these days. Um, to a school and to an admission director in our membership, uh, the thing they want the most from us and the thing they want the most help with uh, are enrollment issues. And, um, and they want us to help them broaden the funnel, uh, increase the funnel at the very top to find more domestic um, students uh, to bring into the, into the funnel, uh, domestic and beyond the domestic um, tag, they're looking for kids who are full and maybe high pay students. Um, there, there is no shortage of students applying to our schools and independent schools who need help financially, but they're seeing, um, but schools, and I can speak just from having been in admissions for so long, uh, it seems like there are fewer and fewer uh, students applying that can afford the tuition. So uh, broadly, we're seeing um, in, uh, tuitions increase an incredible amount just from 2001 to this past year. Um, the seven-day boarding tuitions have gone from twenty-five to almost fifty thousand dollars. So we've got uh, rising tuitions um, and an economy that's struggling, um, and enrollment management that's just become more and more complex. Uh, and um, and so I think schools generally um, are struggling to find these domestic uh, candidates who can afford the tuition. I can say that quite broadly on the. Um, and with the rising tuitions and the tough economy, it's just getting tougher and tougher to sort of to, to fill the beds on the boarding side. And for day student uh, tuitions, I don't think there's um, – we've got data that suggests that, that day student tuitions are also on the rise. Um, in response to this, uh, the Association of Boarding Schools, where, where, I, where I work, um, after we surveyed our members, it became very clear to us that um, while uh, – while our schools are doing well with international enrollment, and some of our schools are growing um, overall, both domestically and internationally, our schools want help finding domestic students. So uh, the, um, the association has pull pulled together a task force of about 15 folks, admission directors, directors of, uh, directors of admission, heads of school, and others, to take a look uh, at the enrollment, um, at enrollment trends and to uh, come up with some strategies on how our schools might reach the broader market. Um, so many people that think of boarding school um, either have a negative um, have a negative perception of what it is or don't know anything about it. So uh, we are working hard um, to to de develop some strategies for our schools to look for and to help them find and bring more families into the fold domestically. And uh, we hope to have recommendations. Our our committee is meeting. Um, we met in April in San Francisco, and we've been meeting in an ongoing way, um, and we'll continue to do so over the next two years to deliver all sorts of strategies to our schools to help them reach the broader market. But there's no doubt um, that many of our schools have seen an increase in international enrollment and a decrease in domestic enrollment. Um, it's it's a, it's a, it's going to be an interesting future for our schools, and we need to get a hold of. Uh, pricing, and we also need to find ways to to spread the message and spread the word about our schools. We all know that what we offer is second to none, um, but um, but boarding schools and independent schools for many have always been se seemingly out of reach and not something that they think about first. And we need to change that. So that's sort of what we're what we're what we're seeing. I've got several <laughs> slides and graphs that. Um, that we can scroll through later on in the presentation, but that's sort of what we're seeing. And I, so I'm, and in my role as director of member relations at Tabs, I'm on the road. And this isn't just, this is information I'm getting. We have empirical data, and I'm also getting this information when I go and meet with directors of admission and heads of school everywhere. This past year, I visited about 50 schools 
Um, and this upcoming year, I intend to visit about 100 schools um, in our membership. And when I do that, I sit down with heads of school, directors of admission, and there is a growing concern um, about enrollment, uh, about pricing, um, and about, and specifically in our marketplace, trying to find more qualified, full or high-paid domestic students. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brendan, is that kind of what you're seeing from the independent school side too, or excuse me, from the the day school side as well? Sort of a more, more challenging market focused on pricing. Yeah, it absolutely is. And Andy, I want your airline miles after this year. <laughs> the schools, that's impressive. Yeah. Um, we're absolutely seeing the same thing. And, and as I get out and meet people, uh, not to the level that Andy does, but um, you know, talk and, and able to interact with other folks in admissions. Um, we see the same stuff for day schools. Price is still a factor. We're not at the levels that boarding schools are at, but it's still pretty high. And again, it depends where you live. So, you know, our senior school tuition is just south of 25000 which might sound okay, but in Pittsburgh, that's pretty high. Um, the thing that I, you know, kind of to go uh, a little bit from Andy, too, is that I think the funnel, which we're here to talk about, is broken. Um, the thing that I'm seeing is that schools increasingly are getting those, um, and I didn't make up this term, those ghost inquiries, where you don't hear about a family, you don't get the inquiry, you don't see that family until they apply. And while that might sound great, like, hey, you know, this came out of the blue, the problem is how about all those families that you didn't get to interact with, those prospective families that made their decision about your school without you having a voice in the conversation. So uh, we can talk about strategies in a little bit that we've used to try to address that. Um, the other thing that I hate about the funnel, and maybe this will tee up Jay, is the funnel for me, kind of that bottom is, uh, signifies an end. And, and I think that really is, that ending is, um, you know, as we think about re-enrollment is problematic. It's easier to re-enroll a student than enroll a student. So to have that funnel be a point is not good because the way we think about it is, you know, inquiry application, visit student, but then we want to think about re-enrollment, then we want to think about alumni, and then we want to think about <clears throat> evangelist, you know. I mean, Jay, I don't know if you're feeling the same thing, but uh, for me, the funnel's dead. I, I'm not sure what it is right. now, what it looks like. I, I have some ideas. Uh, I'll write a blog post about it later, but uh, I, I still have to work that through a little bit. Jay, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I, I would love to, I'm going to circle back to a piece that uh, that Andy did. It was great to see his slides, and I know that uh, if we don't get them up on the show, that um, I, do, I do think that um, they're, they're going to be online for people to take a peek at. I think there's a lesson, um, and Andy, I'd love to, love to see, um, uh, I'd love to get your re reaction to this, but I think there's a lesson in looking at his slides. What I noticed as he showed, as uh, tabs kept for their schools, it was a 14-year decline of, of domestic borders with a 14-year increase in international students. I think right. one, of the le one of the other lessons in here is that we have been trained as an industry to ask very short-term questions. Um, in other words, when you walk into the boardroom, how are we doing compared to last year? That's an important metric. It's an important piece to know. However, when you look at that, uh, this isn't news. Um, it takes years to generate or create a sense of momentum. And then, as, as Andy referenced, some schools are concerned. But I think one of the other lessons from a management perspective certainly is that, um, you know, what is, how do schools begin at every leadership level, especially in the boardroom, to begin to take longer views, to begin to understand what those trends are. So you're not 14 years into this and realize we've got an issue with domestic borders. You're able to pick this up much earlier. So, Andy, I'd love to hear your reaction, but what I've certainly seen in my work now with number of schools, and, I, and by the way, I see the same thing, and we'll, I'm sure, talk about this a little bit later. I see the same issue in, on the advancement and the fundraising side of piece, you know, very short-term measures and looks at what we're doing. So I was struck by that, Andy. I don't know what your reaction is to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean... And I'm not a data head. I've, I've got this information from uh, Richard Phelps, our director of research, and Pete Upham, our executive director, who are data heads. Uh, but you don't need to be one to, to, to take a look at these, at these slides and see um, some pretty clear trends with, um, you know, when I, when I 
when I always when I throw up that pricing trend and people see where our tuitions have gone, you know, um, I think they knew it, but when they see that actual representation uh, in that slide, it it it, it scares people. Um, our our tuitions are climbing, and if we don't have a conversation about pricing, um, when I talk with heads of school, that's the thing that they are are concerned about, and no one has the answer. Um, Part of the North American Boarding Initiative, uh, in addition to thinking about how we better market our schools, we also need to think about enrollment management and best practices around pricing. Um, no one's got the answer, but I know that there are a lot of schools that are getting creative with their pricing and bringing in new revenue streams. So, um, so Jay, I, I agree. You know, you, if you can. You know, I think we do ask questions sort of year to year. Where were we last year? Well, where were we five years ago? Where are we going to be in five years? It, those are the questions we need to be asking. The other slide that I think is is really um, interesting is the one that also that you referenced, Jay, the one that, that shows the, the decline in domestic boarding uh, and the rise in international boarding, at least in our sector. It's, you know, it's very clear that many of our schools are growing and they're telling their boards, hey, we're growing, we're doing well. Uh, but when you dig a little bit deeper, it's clearly on the backs of international students. Um, and, and that is not, that does, the strength of our, of, of our industry, um, I think, can't be dependent only on, on international students, at least in the boarding school world. And I think, you know, Andy, that's, I'll just, real, just real quick, I, 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 on the same page with you. And when I looked at that, you, you do want to ask yourself, was that growth in international students deliberate and on purpose, or was that purely reactionary because the work hadn't been done or the, the conversations that you're having now weren't taking yeah. place? Yeah. I mean, having been out there, I mean, for some, for most schools, it's, it's a reaction. It's a necessity. It's a you know, we're not going to be able to open our doors, we're not going to be able to pay our teachers, we're not going to be able to exist <clears throat> unless we fill the school. And if, and if, and if families aren't thinking about um, lining up, showing up, applying, um, getting involved in this process, um, then it's just not going to happen. And, and again, I come back to this North American Boarding Initiative uh, for TABS. You know, this, is, this is the signal challenge for our industry. Um, for, for boarding schools and and our response to that is to get as many good minds in the room as possible thinking about how we can address our enrollment issues and it can't just be broad marketing we need to we need to do more research we need to understand the market better um, and and so there are many different ways to get at it yes we need to market better yes we need to get the word out and change perceptions that's that's branding and marketing but we can also do more I think in terms of collaboration uh, with one another uh, to know what each school's best policies are. Um, and I think we need, to, we need to get more creative with pricing uh, and we need to get a hold of that. I, I spoke with one head of school this past January who said that she believes we're at a tipping point. It was at a, a Boston area school and she says, we're at a tipping point. She said, in 10 years, um, in 10 years, if we don't have this, this tuition pricing issue figured out, um, I don't know how many of our schools will be around, um, and 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 I think there are many of our heads want to get together and be in conversation about how to do this because we've ignored it long enough. And then, but 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 frankly, there are, there are some people who will tell you that um, that you know tuitions can, can you know interestingly that can, that tuitions could continue to rise and and um, and some schools will just continue to to be just fine. Um, I know there are. I guess what I'd say is there's a, there's a small number of heads who believe that uh, the pricing isn't an issue, but I'm, but I'm, but I don't believe that uh, that they're right. Yeah, Jay, I would argue that um, to answer your question, both schools have done both. Some have done as a knee-jerk reaction to you know balance the budget, and some schools have done it uh, strategically because they have a global studies program. I mean, I'm thinking more on the day school side, but. Uh, boarding as well, because I know a lot of day schools that have just taken international students without having a great plan, they just see dollars. Uh, the schools that are more strategic about it are probably the ones that are also having those conversations that Andy suggested about multiple revenue streams, pricing, net tuition revenue versus traditional financial aid models, you know, and they're thinking big picture like that. Um, 
We currently have no international students. Uh, we want to add them because of a global studies uh, certificate that we have, and we want to do it for the right reasons in the right way. That's why we've been slow to it. The other thing that I thought of is we think backwards, which I agree with your uh, thought, Jay, that you got to think back. But I would argue that after, I think you can only really go back to maybe 08, 09, um, because, I mean, I hate the word new normal, but does that apply here? I think it might, because after that, you know, I think people have changed. Um, I was just having a conversation that when that, you know, what is it, we calling it a crash now? You know, when that happened and it started to affect even our effluent families, um, mindset is different. So we, we really go back to there and then go forward, and that's how we're looking backwards. Yeah. Um, Brendan, I wanted to just chime in. Also, in terms of our market and what we're seeing, you know, I don't think there's another Phillips Andover or Deerfield Academy, you know, coming around the pike, you know, a large traditional boarding school. But it's interesting, uh, in our in our sector, we are seeing day schools, traditional day schools, schools like your school, um, uh, that are adding boarding programs. It's really interesting. Um, schools that have you know, five, six, you know, traditional day schools with five, six hundred day students that are, that are deciding to, for any number of reasons, to add a boarding program. They have 25 or 30 boards and they're applying for membership to our association and we're having really interesting conversations about what that means for our industry, um, and um, and you know, but but they're applying. You know, those that's the growth in in our in our market. The 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 day school that wants to add a boarding program to increase revenue, to increase diversity, yeah. um, you know, to create um, a, a more global community. It's really it's really interesting, and and we think uh, the most thoughtful schools, and there are many of them applying that are meeting our process with success because we believe that we can help them become uh, even better boarding schools. Um, but they're not boarding schools in the traditional sense, right? They're not schools that are, you know, enroll 500 students, the majority of which are boarding students. It's almost the exact opposite. So it's been an interesting question for us, you know, what is a boarding school? Um, but it's interesting to see these day schools adding uh, boarding programs for all sorts of, all sorts of reasons. Yeah, I think that's a slip very slippery slope after being a boarding school alum and having worked at a boarding school for 12 years I have no doubt that you guys tabs can help uh, probably because you're awesome Andy so that's good but uh, you know what's the long-term sustainability of that with having 25 kids you know 24 7 weekend programs emotional support I mean that we're not doing that uh, I would be vehemently opposed to doing that at a day school but I mean people do it but it'll be yeah. interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, yeah, it will. It's it's made us, it's made our board, uh, the committee that reviews applications to the association really ask some interesting and tough questions. Um, so yeah, so it's um, but that's but that's what's coming around the bend for us. You know, I you know while we will we'll welcome new members, you know that are that are traditional boarding schools. Um, I, we've penetrated that market, and uh, it's interesting to see the the these day schools that are adding boarding programs um, for all sorts of all sorts of valid and 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 for all sorts of valid reasons I would say it's interesting we, we spent a lot of time talking about sort of the, the tuition and the, and the enrollment challenges ahead Jay what are you seeing from a philanthropic side in the <clears throat> school world sure I'll, I'll take a swing and uh, at that well you know I'll tell you I was uh, thinking about that uh, the other day and it reminded me of, a, of an article it was uh, two, November 11th um, uh, of uh, November of 2011 in the Harvard Business Review, written by Dan Pallotta, and it was called <clears throat> "Stop Thinking Outside the Box." And, and his point was that a lot of people are being creative, but what happens is they're being creative within the context of all the known. You know, what I when I view the market right now, I view a, a tremendous opportunity for um, organizations that are looking to be creative. And innovative about how they approach the business of raising money. Um, you know, we've again, it's it, it comes back to for me asking what are the things that create real value. And I've had the luxury now of working with a whole bunch of different schools, and I can tell you on average, I'll take the annual fund as an example. 
the 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 way we currently um, measure what we're doing. You know, how are we doing compared to last year? What's our participation rate? These are all good things to know. But I've been able to demonstrate for every school I've worked with that um, of the group of people giving them 80 to 90 percent of their money every year, they lose 70 percent of those people from the first moment they get them. Two years later, whoever that came into that, that's a very expensive model. They also lose about 70 to 80 percent of the gifts that are under $100 that generate our particip participation rate by two years. We've built very expensive models, and what, I, what I'm going back to connect the dots to Dan's article, we're staying in the box. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, Brendan made a point, things are different after 08. Uh, well, things are different than they were back in 1980, and yet we still continue to use some of the same systems and strategies and thought process behind what we're doing. So I think it's a challenge for people, but I will say this. When you look at nationally at giving trends, they, they are, it, it has remained a constant. Um, you're seeing giving at this point on a national level up to pre um, sort of crash time. So, um, but again, our biggest challenge is we've thought all along about acquisition, acquisition, and not about keeping the people once we get them in. You know, Blackbaud just published their piece on, it's just on higher ed. Um, their, able, their ability to renew a first time donor in higher ed is at 26 percent. So if you think about that for, as an industry, that's an incredibly expensive model that uh, 74 percent of the people that you've just acquired are gone in year two. So, um, so I, I, I hope that sort of gets around the edge, but I think the game has changed mm -hmm. uh, uh, in terms of how we connect and how, what we should be looking at. How do we monitor what's successful? How do we design strategy? What, what are the metrics we look at? to build strategy today. Uh, but I think the market, I think there's a huge opportunity uh, for people to choose to really pay attention and, and, and reach out to people in unique and interesting ways. Is that, is the, the, the emissions funnel may be broken, but is the traditional giving pyramid, is that still alive and well? Yeah, you know what, I think there's a lot of talk about that. I sort of look at that, if I were to just say how money is, look, uh, the way wealth is carved up in this country, um, there's a few with a whole bunch of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, th that's, you know, because of the nature of our schools, as successful as the Obama campaign was uh, with crowdfunding, you know, they had a few million people to go after. Uh, that is not the nature of our, our schools. Uh, we, are, uh, we are sort of, we have very defined communities. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, for us, it's going to still be the same, you know, whether you're, um, no matter what the school is, you know, if you're going to head into a campaign, um, you know, for most of our schools out there, it's going to boil down to what do the top 20 or 30 donors choose to do. And that's not going to change uh, for organizations. So I think, yes, short answer, I think from a, from a, from a money perspective, that has remained, that's a constant. Mm -hmm. So you're going back to that, so then in the case of expanding the funnel or perhaps expanding the base of that pyramid and getting not only not only inquiries in there, or whatever the new inquiry is, or maybe the new donor, and then maintaining those relationships as we follow them throughout the process of admissions, and then acceptance and, and enrollment, and then into alumni. You know, what are the ways that, that you guys can see or strategize around sort of trying to expand that pool, expand that that initial funnel, or whatever you want to call it now? Yeah, if, if I could jump in there, we've uh, we've tried a lot of different things, and, and we really shifted as a result of the 08-09 school year and that mess um, into more inbound marketing and social media marketing, and um, you guys have heard me talk about this stuff, but um, the big thing for us is um, to come to the realization that our marketing is not about us anymore. It's not about us. It's about our prospective families, and it's about trying to reach them where they are. So. Uh, to be even more specific, you know, thinking about personas and then ultimately determining what are their pain points and then how do we solve their problems. So one of the things that we've tried to do and had some success is creating, um, even though I just said the funnel's broken, top of the funnel offers. So things that aren't necessarily about Swickley Academy but can help people in their search for a school. So one of the things was a little PDF called 27 Questions to Help You Evaluate a school for your child. Um, it wasn't 
about us. Now we did tailor some of those questions to our strengths, um, which I thought was okay. But you know, somebody again, we're in Pittsburgh. We're a day school. You know, we have kids about an hour or so away. You know, if somebody in uh, California downloads downloads this PDF, they could find it helpful. Now they're never going to come here. Um, now we do things on the back end, so you you would download this. The other thing is to try to make a very low barrier to entry, so we don't ask, you know, their full life story on the inquiry form. We ask for their name and their email and the grade that they're interested in. Um, not to get too technical, but we do that, and then after they fill that out, we would drop them into another form, so that if they want to learn about Swiftly Academy, they could do that, and then we put them in a lead nurturing campaign. Um, where we actually, after three days, send them the answers to the questions for our school, and then we drop other things in there to be helpful. Um, and, and we've had success with raising our inquiries. Now, the thing we've learned is that, um, you know, four out of the last five years, we've, we've increased our inquiries, we're, we've increased our applicants, and we've increased our campus visits. So those are the kind of interest indicators that we track. But doesn't necessarily always mean we're going to get more students, because there's so many other financial aid, school choice, relocation is big in a day school. Um, but I'd rather have those eyeballs looking at us than not looking at us. I don't know if you guys have tried similar things or different things. Yeah. I mean, one thing I will definitely say is that, um, you know, I hear more and more from, from schools and from folks trying to help kids get to schools that the process I don't know about the funnel, but the process of applying to our schools is, is quite um, quite cumbersome. You know, I mean, a million different, seemingly a, a million different ways to do it, and a million different um, perspectives from schools on what they want. You know, they want their application, they want their recommendation. They take this, they don't, they don't take that. Um, there are a lot of different um, there are a lot of different um, avenues you can go down to apply to a school, and um, and. And I think trying to, to streamline that um, and to maybe pull together some sort of a unified application is something that that could um, make it easier and get more more folks into the funnel and and, and applying to our schools. But um, I hear it from consultants, from placement people, from parents. I mean, from all angles. Man, applying to you know it's easier to apply to college. And um, and I. And, and, and it's unfortunate if oh, there's... Perhaps not this year with it, the switchover on the common application. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, and it, you know, in my, in my mind, if, if we're losing 100, you know, what, any number, 10, 15, 100, 1,000 families a year that are, that are throwing up their hands and, and quitting before they get, you know, before they complete the process because it's, um, because it's difficult, um, I worry about that. In some ways, and I agree that you know the, the you know the new inquiry is the application. That, you know, when I left admissions, I mean, sh we definitely tracked inquiries, but it was, it was seemingly a, a useless statistic. You used to worry how were we, you know, week to week, year to year, in, in terms of, of inquiries, and it didn't really translate uh, to enrollment. Uh, it was all about applications. So I wonder if we need to be talking about that. I, I, I just want to build on one thing and just I, I think Brandon's right on the money with the piece about um, you know being a resource. I think that's an important piece. I can remember um, my first case NACE conference I was speaking at. It was 1999. I asked a room of independent schools, does anybody use the word excellence um, in their material? Surprisingly, uh, pretty much everybody in the room did, which meant nobody owns it, nobody believes it. And I think that's even truer today. So I, I think I think the idea of of providing information that help people, you know, what are things to look for if your child's having an issue in the sixth grade or whatever it happens to be. How do you be how do you define your community and then how do you be a resource and then figure out how to pull people in much differently than we have traditionally. Um, I think I think I think that's a great idea, Brennan. How many of our schools talk about the close knit community that we have on campus and the care and attention that their students are going to get? I would imagine every single one of us for the most part. Sure. I would think so. And, and you know what? I'm not sure the price thing, you know, I, I, I think we've got to be creative with price, but until we figure out how to teach and educate children without people, um, we're not going to be able to scale the kind of work we do. You know, while other industries have been able to use technology to scale it, you know, our communities are based 
all on hum predominantly human capital, and and so you know that. And if we don't want experienced human, you know, faculty, then I guess we can have a lower rate. But if we want experience and people want it, um, you know, or our schools are going to shrink in half and we have to double our tuitions. Um, it, you know, Andy, maybe that's a different way. You know, it's, it's not fifty grand anymore. It's a hundred grand, and here's what you get. Right. Um, you know, I don't know, but I, but I hear you. I, I, I don't. I think we're a highly labor business, unlike most industries that have been able to scale with technology. I mean, we're. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think if you look at the the expense side of any of our schools here, I think you'd see that the human resources piece is probably the biggest line, biggest line item budget on there as yeah. far as salaries and benefits. Yeah. And, well, yeah, I mean, I, one of the other threats, I think, to our, to the independent school industry in general, though, is online education. I'd be interested um, to hear folks' thoughts about that. I, I'm, I'm no expert, but I know that every conference I go to, I feel like that's, that's something that's... Um, that's brought up, you know. I mean, there are you know strong public schools that are free, um, you know, and uh, charter schools and online opportunities. I mean, they're all you know they're all sorts of things, you know, in the maelstrom that we're sort of trying to to navigate. But I think one of the things that 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 we need to be aware of, um, while and many of our schools are traditional, um, you know, some are innovative, most are traditional, but and so some of them are adopting online models um, a, as they innovate, but I think that is a threat to our to the independent school industry, um, if, if, if threat is the right word to use, but I think it is. Um, families are choosing that, uh, and there are some fantastic options. You guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, we see that as competition, and actually where we're located in Pittsburgh, we have some great other independent school options. Uh, but we would actually view our competition as being the local very, very good public schools and the, you know, Pittsburgh has a big Catholic school tradition. So if you're looking at, uh, you know, we have charter, we have online, um, we don't see a lot of cross app with that necessarily. A um, little bit of homeschool, not so much though. But, you know, we hear the good enough. Uh, oh, geez, it's $20,000 for lower school. You know, it's it's good enough to go to the public school, um, especially as the you know in Pittsburgh the um, the school age population for children you know in lower schools lower. So we see public schools that have comparable uh, you know student teacher ratios almost. Um, now it gets worse as you go to middle and, and senior school at high school, but that's what we're seeing is that you know and it drives me crazy that good enough argument, but. I, you know, I, I, I think threat is probably a pretty good word um, because it captures people's attention. Um, I think the other piece in it is we have to become smarter um, at articulating our presence to wherever we're marketing. Because I think we probably all agree that knowledge on its own is getting cheaper. Um, so if we're going to compete on subject matter, we're not going to win that day. Um, because the online school is going to be able to do that much more efficiently. They can scale that. Um, so I think we're going to have to really figure out what is it that makes the value proposition take us to that place. And I think as an industry, and Andy, I'd be, well, I'm interested in everybody's thoughts on this, but as an industry, we're going to have to get much smarter at how we explain what that value is in a way that it connects with people. Because I, knowledge now is cheap. And if we try to compete there, I'm not sure we can win that day. Yeah, I agree. And I, you know, I, again, I mentioned this only because, you know, when you go to conferences, you hear about that threat. Um, but I don't know that I ever, when I would call a family up after we'd admitted them and wanted to find out where they were going, you know, the response was, you know, he's not going to your school. He's going to, you know, online academy. I don't know that I ever had that. But I think that's, you know, again, as we're thinking – Five, ten years out, you know, and we had that, you mentioned that earlier, Jay, I think it's not going to be too far off than when directors of admission like Drew and Brendan and others in our industry call family and say, well, where did little Johnny decide to go to school next year? And the response is going to be, well, he's going to be studying online. Um, it'll be interesting. I'm very interested to see where that goes. Well, Andy, wait till they say that 
you know, Johnny's going to Khan Academy. Exactly. You know, and then we're like, oh, okay. Now, again, Jay, your point, the whole idea of the value proposition is huge. And schools have to figure it out because I think Drew was saying, oh, small community, small class, caring community, small class, you know, that's the old put our mission statements up on the wall and they're all the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we need to figure that out. Right, but if, but if that is the message and it is consistent, I mean, if we do believe we have great, you know, you get great attention, the small classes, um, the caring adults, you know, all of that stuff, that those are, those are sort of touchstones key things that have always been uh, important in our in our world. Um, I don't think we can back off of that. I mean, just because everyone's message is the same doesn't mean that it's not unique to each school. I mean, I believe I think we all believe to our phones that that we do a, that we that we do it as well as anyone, and that 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 um, connection with other people and great adults in your life is is the difference maker. Um, and so for me. I think the message is getting through. Certainly, we can do a better job at it. I, I just, it, for me, it all comes back to the pricing piece. You know, um, I think uh, certainly we can do a better job branding and advertising and 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 and, and spreading the word. Um, and uh, but until we get that pricing piece, um, that to me is is the central issue. It's the elephant in the room. Yeah, the, the other thing, Jay, I, I agree, I don't want to run away from the caring community small class, but for us, we think about who we're competing against. So if we're talking to a family that's looking at us in the public school, that's a great argument because those are things that they don't have. But we're looking at a family who is looking at the other independent schools. What is the difference if we're both the same? Because if we don't tell our story, they're going to find it someplace else. Um, you know, great could be online for stuff that we've put out. Bad could be the cocktail conversation or you know aisle four of the local grocery store um, mm -hmm. when we don't have a say in what's going on. So, so yeah, well, I, guess, right. I don't want to run away from that stuff. For us, it's thinking you know who are we competing against? Right, it's changing the language, right? So it's not if we're going to all talk about uh, you know those caring communities, small classrooms. I mean, how do you do it differently than say X? School or X Academy. What's the difference between what you do and what your, you know, use a crossword product is, versus this other school that I'm looking at too, who's you know relatively the same price. What am I going to get differently there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it even becomes more complicated as we are on higher ed lives. So you think of colleges, and you know, I don't think they're selling small classes per se. Uh, you know, what's the flavor of their school? What's the, um, you know, what makes one university different from another, yeah. and uh, you know they need to be able to articulate that. Yeah, and you know, it's these are conversations having been in the college world, you know, five years ago, and you know, from like '04 to '09, you know, these are the exact same common conversations we were having then. And I'm sure Andy, you know, you had the same ones too when you were in high ed too. What's you know how we afford the pricing's an issue? Like how do we get the word out? Shrinking demographic. I mean, these are all things that. You know, as colleges have done before or have seen coming through, and I think we're seeing it maybe a little bit further in advance of them as well. Because yeah. we've got the kids before they do. Right. Yeah, and hence, you know, as we, as I travel around and we travel around and we survey our members and we, and we try to, um, you know, uh, deliver value to our membership, uh, we hear loud and clear that this is the issue that where they want help. They want help on pricing strategies. They want help on marketing. They want us to wave the flag and bring more people into the conversation at the top of the funnel um, so that uh, so that they can so that they can grow. And they're looking for qualified, high, full pay kids because because there seem to be fewer and fewer of them pursuing our schools. And so it's a it's not going to be uh, an easy. There's no easy solution, and I think, um, again, in, in our world, in our sector, um, this North American Boarding Initiative Task Force that we pulled together is really um, coming up with some creative thinking. I'm really excited about that for our schools. Um, the, the folks that are on the task force have been putting it, they've been broken into three teams of five, and they've been meeting weekly um, to pull together ideas, and over the next two years, we're going to be honing those ideas, bringing them to our membership. Um, well, to our board first, and then to our membership to see um, to see what they think, and um, and we think 
you know, there, 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 there will be a laser sort of focus from our association on enrollment, specifically domestic enrollment for our schools. Um, so it's great to have all these really sharp people in a room in sort of a think tank thinking about how we can get at this. And all of these issues that we've talked about today are issues that, that, are, um, that are in circulation uh, for our group. So we've got about you know ten or fifteen minutes left here. I just I hate leaving conversations on a down note and talking about threats and challenges. But I mean, is there some good news out there? Like, do we have things like that we can be excited about and happy, like look forward to and feel positive about? Well, the the pirates are above five hundred after yeah. July fourth, so that's always good. But yeah. you know, I'm <laughs> I'm uh, uh, I guess in the good news, you know. Uh, I still like coming to work. I still think our schools are great places to be. Uh, I'm reminded of graduation, which seems like forever ago now, and uh, you know, super pumped about our alums. I mean, these kids are fantastic, and they're going to do great things. So I think, uh, again, Drew used the word product, but it is a product, and I think, uh, you know, I'm still very happy with the product that we're producing. Um, so maybe that's positive. Yeah. You know what, and, and um, uh, Drew, I think this is a, a great time to be raising money, and the and uh, and I've always felt that I, I've done this for almost twenty years because, as it turns out, people still want to make the world a better place. Um, people still want to be part of something that impacts people's lives in a positive way. We are in, you know, I used to joke with people, you know, I, I said, the raising of money and I think education in general is a business is is an industry of optimism. You know, I've I've been raising a little money for a while, but no one's ever said, Jay, please take this hundred grand. Your initiative is doomed. You know, um, <laughs> these these are people that believe uh, something better is possible. And so I, you know, I I think we're in a great industry. I think it's a great time to be doing it. I think I think part of the tone of all this is it is a time of extraordinary change not something that we have traditionally as an industry been very good with. Um, you know, we've been really exceptional at keeping sort of things the way they've been. Um, you know, I, I, I was at a school recently um, and, I, and I, um, I brought, I didn't make too many friends in the boardroom, but they were having a conversation. I went back into the minutes and I could pull out minutes from a board meeting 25 years earlier and it was the exact same question. And my point was, I don't know how you move forward unless you actually change what you're talking about. But So that's one piece that's a challenge, but at the same time, we connect with families, we connect with wonderful families, we connect with great civil alumni and current parents that want to support the work that we do. Um, and so I, that to me is what has people wanting to get up in the morning and get to work. I think it's an incredibly great time to be doing what we do. Um. Let me chime in as well, um, and uh, and Drew, I think uh, you'll like what I'm about to say. I've, um, you know, I travel around, and I, you know, you hear all this doom and gloom about how schools are struggling, and then all you have to do is go to a place like Vermont Academy and meet someone like Sean Brennan, um, who is, who came into that school, uh, I don't know how many years ago it was, um, five years ago, five years ago, and and. And it's not just at Vermont Academy, it's not just Sean, but I've been visiting schools and I'm seeing schools that are thriving, that have really strong leadership, which makes me feel really good in that I feel like this is in our hands and getting the and, and, and schools that get the right combination of people. You show me a winning head of school, a winning director of admission um, facing hard times and you know and you show me a strong leadership team and I'll show you a school that's persevering and even thriving in this marketplace so Vermont Academy um, and there are others I've seen um, and I leave really inspired you know I it, it's rare that I see schools that are that, that sort of that when they open the door and, and greet me are like man we're in trouble you know, <laughs> you know it's it's most schools that are opening the door and saying we really want to show you what we've got and they're acknowledging that times are tough, but that they're meeting those tough times, um, and that they're doing well. And um, again, I, I, I visited uh, Vermont Academy, and maybe the coldest day I've ever ex experienced in my life. <laughs> this past 
January. It was only like October, January, was it? <laughs> uh, it was January. And, um, it wasn't even snowing. <laughs> the polar vortex or whatever it was called, and I'm walking around um, and um, was totally left totally inspired, and, and that had to do with the leadership of the school, and they're doing really well amongst in, in tough times. And for me, that the positive message there is this is in our hands. Um, Vermont Academy isn't doing well because just because they're doing well because they have strong leadership and so I think um, it's in our hands and uh, you get the right people in place you can make things happen. Well that's great. Uh, thanks for that, that shameless plug. <laughs> Check is in the mail. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> We're not getting your sweatshirts in the mail. Um, well, I think what I'm hearing here today is that, yeah, so here's the reality of the marketplace, and you guys feel free to chime in at any time. It's challenging, right? And we've got a product which is expensive, uh, in my opinion, and I think all of yours, worth every single penny. Um, and the challenge is finding the audience, uh, talking to the audience in a way that we're sharing the value of the education that we provide to them and the life-changing experiences that they and their children will have here, and then um, you know, using all of our tools in our in our in, in, in strategic thinking to really drive home those messages to those people, and then getting them onto our campuses, showing them around, and, and having, helping them like delivering on those promises, so they've got an incredible experience here. And then you know, relaying the value of the education that they experience as they become alumni, and getting them to give back to the school. I can kind of sum that up in a rough two minutes here. Um, and part of the reason why I was so excited to bring you guys on, because I think what schools, you know, Andy, you're definitely right, like leadership I think is absolutely crucial in the school. But also it's, Jay, your point of it's thinking outside the box, knocking down the walls of the box, and being able to think creatively and think differently so we're not having those same conversations that we had back in 1990, you know, which in the marketplace is totally different. And then, uh, Brennan, we didn't really dive into this a lot, but your total numbers metrics guy, you know, making sure we've got systems in place so that we're making sure that we're maintaining the appropriate contacts and, and doing all that we can do to deliver on that and measuring ourselves against that. That's, I think, how you, you be successful. You've you got to have the right product in place, too, but I think that's how you achieve success in this market. Sound, sound about right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Well, um, Andy, I know you've got to get on a plane here uh, pretty soon, so we want to make sure you get out to the uh, the private jet on the runway, uh, the TABS private jet. You don't want to make the uh, the pilot late. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll be the guy in in the back of the plane with my little uh, my little boy, trying to keep him quiet with the, <laughs> the iPad. But uh, good luck with that one. Exactly. Jay, it looks like you've got a cabana out back that window waiting for you. Some nice yeah, so, drink. Yeah, unfortunately, right after this, I head down to Clearwater Beach for the rest of the weekend. Right on. Brendan, Pittsburgh Pirates game or something like that? Nothing that exciting, guys. Nothing that exciting, but it's been great. Thank you. Yeah, thank I know. I want to thank all three of you for, for joining us on this. It, uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been great to be able to connect. Jay, I don't think I've seen you in person in about nine years since I first started this job, so it's... It's always good to see you, and uh, uh, Brennan and Andy, it's great to, great to connect as well. Um, well, thank you for having us. Absolutely. Hopefully we'll do it again sometime. Thank you very much, thank Drew. Right, let's do it in person. Thanks, um, guys. So uh, thank you to everyone. I hope you have enjoyed uh, this episode of Higher Ed Live. This is my first time in the afternoon, prime time. Um, and thanks again uh, to our sponsors uh, of M. Stoner and Omni uh, Update. I can't thank our guests enough. We'll be back next week with shows from Admissions, Student Affairs, and Marketing Live. Need a reminder? Receive a quickly nudge uh, about our shows by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. Want to make more want more professional development? Browse the archives at higheredlive.com or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Uh, again, my name is Drew Milliken. Thanks for joining us. Ashley Budd will be here uh, next month uh, for more on Higher Ed Live. Take care, all.